I'd like to be a good evening to all those who have joined us for this class period. Uh, we are currently in the study of uh, the Book of Romans. Last time we left off at uh, the ninth chapter, starting with verse 17. <clears throat> Before we get started, though, let's have a short word of prayer. Heavenly Father, will you bless the study of ours of thy holy word? We're grateful that thou saw fit to leave us a record of thy will for us. We pray that as diligent students of thy word, we are incorporated into our lives to live as thou would have us live in this cruel and dark world. May we be a light to the world, a lamp that cannot be hid, that city upon the hill. But in all things, may we do honor to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ by abiding by his will in the flesh that we may enjoy the glory of the, the life to come. We ask this in his name. Amen. <clears throat> <clears throat> it says in verse 17, for the scripture says to the Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Now this is a further confirmation of the negative answer given in verse 14. <clears throat> the scripture say means God says as seen from what is said to Pharaoh. But indeed, for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name be, may be declared in all the earth. That comes from Exodus, the ninth chapter, verse 16. <clears throat> God set up Pharaoh uh, to be king, that is, he raised him up. Uh, did this prove God to be unjust? No. There could be no injustice merely by setting up the man to be Pharaoh. Nor was there any injustice by God displaying his power over Pharaoh. Furthermore, God did not make Pharaoh wicked, so God can demonstrate his power over him. God set him up to be Pharaoh. But as to his being wicked, <clears throat> God had no more hand in that than in the fall of Adam. Pharaoh made himself wicked against God's will and pleasure. It is God's right, however, to use wicked men to accomplish his purposes, as it is his right to use good men to the same end. God used Pharaoh and Jesus used Judas, since each was suitable only for the end to which they were used. <clears throat> The use of them did not determine their doom. They did that themselves. As God could do nothing better with them than that for which they were suited, there was no injustice by God in doing so. <clears throat> in verse 18, it reads, Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Whatever mercy shows does not determine salvation. That depends on the individual. The mercy he showed to Jacob made no easier for Jacob to be saved than it did Esau. After he rejected Esau, it was no harder for him to be saved than it was for Jacob. When Pharaoh was confronted with the plagues, his heart softened. When the plagues were removed, his heart hardened. Each plague was miraculous, but it did not permanently produce the desired result in Pharaoh's heart. Accordingly, after having done much more to change Pharaoh's heart than God has done for any other man, <clears throat> God withheld any further use of miraculous power to change his heart. God once again used his miraculous power to subdue him in his heart-hardened condition, and God was just in doing so. 
In the 19th verse of chapter 9, <clears throat> uh, Paul writes, You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? <clears throat> now these are rhetorical questions that Paul does not answer, uh, no doubt, because the answer is so obvious. But if he did, what would he say? <clears throat> If he makes us just what we are, regardless of our will or agency, and if we cannot resist his will to make us what we are, then how can he find fault with us if we are disobedient to him? After we did just what he made us to do, so the reasoning goes, uh, but God does not do this. <clears throat> Men make themselves what they are. If a sinner uh, then, again, God finds fault with them. And if obedient, then God justifies them through the blood of Christ. The choices that God makes, <clears throat> such as in the case of Jacob and Esau, makes neither one saved or lost. God finds fault with the Jacobs or the Esau's of the world, not on the basis of the choice he makes between and among them, but only when they could have done right but did wrong. And the rhetorical questions then are far from being unanswerable. It is that they deserve no response. <clears throat> In verse uh, 20, it reads, but indeed, O man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, Why have you made me like this? It is for it is presumptuous for the creature to question the Creator. <clears throat> we read in Isaiah the twenty ninth chapter verse sixteen, surely you have things turned around. Shall the potter be esteemed as the clay? Or shall the thing made say of him who made it, he did not make me? Or shall the thing formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? In Isaiah the 45th chapter verse 9, it reads there, Woe to him who strives with his maker. Let the potsherds strive with the potsherds of the earth. Shall the clay say to him who forms it, What are you making? Or shall your handiwork say, He has no hands? Did Ishmael have the right to say to God, Why did you reject me? Did Esau have the right to say to God that he has done him wrong in rejecting him? No, in each case. Well, if neither has that right, and they do not, shall rejected Israel say to God, Why have you treated us this way? God chose Isaac and rejected Ishmael. <clears throat> and he said, Right. God chose Jacob and rejected Esau. And you said, Right. And that's what the, uh, the Jews were saying. At the first, he chose the Jews and rejected the Gentiles. And the Jews had no objection. Now he has chosen the Gentiles and rejected the Jewish nation. So do you Jews dare say wrong? If you Jews endorse the first two cases, then you cannot rightly object to the last case. <clears throat> Does a potter have power of the clay? He reads in verse 21. From the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor. Now this is a uh, continuation of the thoughts of, the, of uh, verse 20. Uh, the potter not only has the power over the clay, he also has the right. Here the potter is God and humans are the clay. God has both the power and the right over the clay to make uh, from it one vessel for honor 
and another for dishonor. Now, honor and dishonor are, are not as the Calvinists would have it. God had the power to make Isaac honorable and Ishmael not, to make Jacob honorable and Esau not, to make Israel honorable and the Gentiles not, or to make the Gentiles honorable and Israel not. God has the power and the right to do this, so who can rightly complain? Now, these vessels just uh, enumerated were either honored or dishonored, uh, that is, chosen or not chosen, but they were neither saved nor condemned by being honored or dishonored. <clears throat> the Calvinist view is that the individual made for honor is he, he whom God by his own sovereign power appoints to heaven, while the one made for dis dishonor is he whom God appoints to hell. If true, then no one is responsible for any act, no matter how good or how evil. More than that, how is it possible to define good or evil? God has always intended to accept those who of their own free will obey his son, whether Jew or Gentile, and reject the rest. <clears throat> Verse 22, what if God wanting, and uh, King James and the ASV has willing, and the Greek is willing, uh, what if God wanting to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long-suffering the vessels of wrath, that's the wicked, uh, prepared, or as the King James and ESV says, fitted for destruction. Uh, I think the word wanting is better translated by the King James and the ESV versions as willing. Uh, the New King James may, may give the notion that God is just itching to show his wrath. <clears throat> the better idea is that after due deliberation, he not only is willing to show his wrath, but it, he is also determined to do so. <clears throat> From the origin of sin to the present, God has been bearing with the wicked. Uh, mercy and forbearance are attributes of God, but not injustice. God's wrath is his sense of justice in punishing the wicked. Uh, power is what God can do. Uh, prepared or fitted for destruction does not mean prepared, fitted, or ready for destruction by God, but by their own evil deeds. <clears throat> In the 23rd verse we read, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. <clears throat> Riches of his glory means abundant glory. Now, the vessels of mercy are those who have accepted Christ. He prepared them for glory when, in consequence of their obedience to Christ, he forgave their sins. Whatever awaited them in glory, it was prepared for them and now awaits them. In John, the 14th chapter, uh, verses 1 through 3, we read, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. So this glory has been prepared for him, and it's a wedding for those who are obedient to his will. <clears throat> In verse 24, uh, it's a continuation of 23. 23 says, which he had prepared before him for glory, even us whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. <clears throat> and we could add some words here to, to make it a little clearer. Instead of saying just even us, we could 
say he showed mercy even on us. And the us is the saved. So he showed mercy on the saved whom he called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Now God calls us by the gospel and it was in that act that he showed mercy. He also showed mercy in remitting our sins. In the matter of the calling, he has called Jews and Gentiles alike. He wants to make all vessels of honor. Now God is not unjust. He sends the call to all, you know, with the same gospel, same Christ, same promises. Beyond this, he strictly discriminates in bestowing mercy between the obedient, that is, those who obey his son, and the disobedient, those upon whom he will pour out his wrath. To the faithful, he calls to the honors of the gospel that he may finally crown them with his glory. To the unfaithful, he endures with much forbearance, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But he is resolved with, to punish them at last. <clears throat> in verse 25 of chapter 9, as he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who are not my people, and her beloved who are not my beloved. That's from Hosea, the second chapter, verse 23. And by its use, it also includes the uh, Gentiles. <clears throat> Paul establish, establishes by prophecy that the Gentiles are to become the people of God and that only a remnant of Israel is to be saved. A time will come when the Gentiles will obey the gospel and be saved. The Gentiles were not a chosen people in the sense that Israel was a chosen people. At the time of this writing, Paul writing, the Jews uh, were known as the beloved. <clears throat> Later, the church will be the beloved, uh, no matter who comprises it. <clears throat> in verse 26, and it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there that they shall be called the sons of the living God. In Isaiah, the, the first, ver, uh, first chapter, verse 9, it reads there, in the place where it was said to them, you are not my people, there it shall be said to them, you are sons of the living God. Uh, here in Isaiah, the uh, first chapter, verse 9, the same idea as in verse 26. Uh, Paul's use of these passages from Hosea is the best evidence of what God intended them to convey. He is not citing these passages to express his own ideas, but because it proves that God has had purposed and how long ago that the Gentiles would become his people as well. The reception of the Gentiles having been established by Hosea, Paul proceeds to prove from Isaiah that only a remnant of Israel is to be saved. <clears throat> In verse 27, Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, uh, the remnant will be saved. And Isaiah the 10th chapter, verse 22, it uh, reads, For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. So the implication is that uh, only a remnant of the Jews will be saved. And this uh, remnant consisted of those Jews who accepted Christ. Uh, the remainder, the uh, vast majority of them, were all rejected. It was this rejection that saddened Paul and gave him grief, as he expressed in verse 2 of this chapter, uh, that, you know, uh, that he would uh, be lost for them. As recorded in Matthew, the 23rd chapter, verse 37, there Jesus said, O Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. God placed before them the alternatives, Christ and life, or not Christ and death. They deliberately chose the latter. Therefore, they had only them, themselves to blame. In verse 28 of uh, chapter 9, <clears throat> For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. Now the ASV uh, reads a little differently. It says, For the Lord will execute his word upon the earth, finishing it and cutting it short. In Isaiah the 10th chapter, verse 23, it reads there, For the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Paul follows the sense of the Isaiah passage rather than the verbiage. Now, the work refers to the saying of Isaiah that the remnant of Israel will be saved. Upon the earth can also be translated upon the land, in which case it is referring to Israel. This is its use in Isaiah the 10th chapter verse 23 that we read. So it's likely that uh, Paul was had the same idea here. Uh, he will finish the work of saving the remnant quickly. That is God. <clears throat> In the 29th uh, verse of chapter 9, <clears throat> and as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom, and we would have been made like Gomorrah. And that comes from Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 9, unless the Lord of hosts had left to us a very small remnant, we would have become like Sodom, we would have been made like Gomorrah. Now, this reinforces what Paul said in verses 27 and 28. And this is further proof that a mere remnant of Israel is to be saved. The Lord of Sabaoth is the Lord that rears them up and preserves them. Uh, left us, that left us a seed, left us refers to the Israelites. A seed is a remnant. Sodom and Gomorrah are extinct. Except for the remnant, Israel would have been extinct. In verse uh, 30 of chapter 9, What shall we say then? The Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness of faith. Now how do we account for what has been said? <clears throat> uh, Israel is rejected and the Gentiles are in their place. Now, why did the Gentiles not pursue righteousness? Well, it could be because they knew nothing about it and therefore knew not uh, to pursue it. Or it could be that they had become so indifferent uh, that they cared nothing for it. Uh, the attained righteousness, or they attained righteousness not by mere belief, a belief accompanied by obedience. And obedient faith implies a full acceptance of the gospel and obedience to all its requirements, whether of belief or practice. When the Gentiles believed in Christ and obeyed his gospel, their sins were remitted. They were justified. The justification they sought by belief in Christ and not by works of the law. The belief that motivated them was not a mere conviction of the heart, but included the acts that go with belief. Prior to the offer of Christ to them, they were a rejected people, 
and were not seeking justification. As soon as the gospel was presented to them, they obeyed it and consequently obtained the favor of God. Their reception of Christ and consequent justification were the reasons why they became God's people. Now that is you know, the way it always was and is. <clears throat> In verse 31, but Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Now this will be clarified in, in verse 22, but Israel, in pursuing the law of righteousness, were pursuing a law of righteousness based on works or keeping the law. They could not keep the law perfectly, uh, which justification by law required them to do. <clears throat> Therefore, they had not attained justification. Verse 32, is, it says, why? Yeah, that's to the, uh, what's been said before, why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Israel had not attained justification because they sought it through a law of works, which justified, and such a law did not exist. Justification by belief is practical. Justification by works of the law, practically impossible. Gentiles chose to be justified by faith, the Jews by works of the law. Thus the Gentiles were accepted, the Jews were not. That stumbling stone uh, that's mentioned is Christ. The Jews maintain that justification could not be attained except by their law. They pursued it so vigorously as to stumble at Christ. Accordingly, they repudiated, repudiated Christ. Their argument was the law alone justified, therefore, they rejected the gospel because it says that justification is only possible by obedient faith in Christ. They followed the illusion of the law and missed the reality of Christ. <clears throat> Verse 33, it says, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. And whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Christ was uh, placed in Zion to be a savior, not a not a stumbling stone. But uh, should Israel reject him, he will be to them a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. Christ is salvation to him who accepts him. He is ruin to him who does not. He who believes on the Christ shall be justified and not be condemned in judgment. Therefore, he shall have no cause for shame. Shame is reserved for those that repudiate Christ as Israel was doing. <clears throat> Beginning with uh, verse uh, chapter 10, verse 1. Paul writes, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God uh, for Israel, uh, you might say that the Nestlean uh, translation as Israel, the Texas Receptus says them, but still it, it's referring to Israel. Israel's been talked about, so that Israel is implied. My uh, heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Uh, Paul is still considering the case of the Jews. Uh, brethren likely refers to the disciples in Rome to whom he addresses this epistle. He is concerned, however, for the unbelieving Jews. Uh, his love for his countrymen instilled in his heart a desire that they uh, be saved. He knew the, that if they did not abandon their unbelief, they would be lost. Considering what had been prophesied in the opposite of the uh, Jews, Paul must have known that they would have been lost. 
was he asking God to save them despite this? The Jews were not lost by some irrevocable decree that was determined by their own willful rejection of Christ, but it was not unalterable. Hence, Paul could rightfully and properly ask God to avert it. Man does not know all the resources available to the Father to cause one to consider their spiritual condition and as a result abandon disbelief and render obedient to Christ. <clears throat> there is nothing more important to man than his salvation. So, if it takes the removal of everything dear to him in the life of the, in the flesh to cause him to consider seriously his spiritual condition, then it is worth it. How God brings us about is left to him. <clears throat> In verse 2, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. <clears throat> Paul considered their zeal for God uh, to be a good thing, and it provided a basis for hope, uh, however, however feeble that hope may be. Their zeal seemed to be, to be based on bigotry and blindness, and as such would be a, an enemy uh, or an impediment to change, but not an insuperable obstacle. <clears throat> knowledge here is specific knowledge of what God has taught about justification, and beyond that, a correct understanding of his teaching. Uh, this, the great mass of Jews did not possess, not because it was unattainable, but because the teaching did not fit their expectation of the uh, prophesied Messiah. Had they read Moses and the prophets correctly, they would have recognized Christ as the long-awaited Messiah and greeted him with joy. <clears throat> now, their zeal, however, only served to propagate error. In verse 3 of Romans, 10th chapter, for they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. <clears throat> they rejected every fact that pointed uh, to the way to be justified by God. <clears throat> Rather than accepting what God had to say on the matter, they went about establishing their own system of justification. Now, they assumed their system to be right and therefore were not receptive to any argument against it. This blind and unreasoning obstinacy was not peculiar to the Jews of that day, but it persists to this day in that Protestant denominations have persistently, dogmatically, and prescriptively established their own system of justification by faith only, apart from works of obedience. <clears throat> Such a system of righteousness is neither asserted nor implied in any verse in the New Testament. Quite simply, they have not submitted to the righteousness of God. <clears throat> uh, one submits to the righteousness of God by being obedient to Christ. Being obedient to Christ is complying with the conditions of justification which he has prescribed. Quite simply, compliance is achieved by uh, one, belief, uh, two, obedience, springing out of it. No one who believes only without obeying can be justified for faith or belief without works is dead. For that matter, one who obeys only without uh, faith uh, can be justified. Uh, <clears throat> well, I should say one who, obey, who obeys only uh, without faith uh, and cannot be justified. Both are condemned. Belief and works are inseparable. Some of these acts of obedience must be performed by alien sinners, those outside of the kingdom, and some by those within the kingdom, Christians. 
in the case of alien sinners, uh, one must first believe that's something they must do. Faith must be accompanied by repentance. Repentance is something they must do. Then after that, they must confess that Christ, Christ is the Son of God. That is something they must do. And then they must be baptized. That is something they must do. And once that's done, then God can save them. They can be saved. And that is something God does, not them. In the case of those within the kingdom, uh, that is the church, it is those acts of duty in which they work out uh, their own salvation, uh, wherein they walk in newness of life. <clears throat> in verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The old law pointed to Christ. The final great purpose of the law was justification. Christ was the fulfillment of that purpose. He therefore is the end of the law for righteousness. The end is realized by those and those only who believe in Christ. It is never realized by those who seek it in partial obedience and none attain it in perfect obedience. The Jews sought justification by law, which required perfect obedience, yet never achieved perfect obedience. When Paul says to everyone who believes, the implication is that he who believes will also obey. A disobedient belief is never here contemplated. <clears throat> In verse 5, uh, Paul writes, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things, that is the requirements of the law, shall live by them. Justification by an obedient faith is entirely different from justification by keeping the law. The phrase righteousness which is of the law means a righteousness Arising, arising out of the law as its source. Of course, if it were ever kept perfectly, it would. Since only Christ kept it perfectly, justification by the law is merely a theoretical possibility, never a reality. <clears throat> the quotation, the man who does those things shall live by them, is taken from several Old Testament and New Testament sources, uh, but only two here are here quoted in Leviticus, the 18th chapter, verses 4 through 5. 4 and 5, you shall observe my judgment and keep my ordinances to walk in them. I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. And in Galatians, the third chapter, verses 10 through 12, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not contain in all things, uh, or continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. If the law is not a faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. A man must do without exception, now do them without exception or failure. It is justification, justification on the grounds of merit and not grace. It is a debt, not a favor. A right that cannot be withheld. Since no man except Christ has done them, None shall inherit eternal life by them. In verse 6 of chapter 10, But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that, that is, bring Christ down from above. And of course, uh, we'll get into verse 7 later, but it says there, or Who will ascend to the, into the abyss, that is, to bring, bring Christ up from the, the dead. Paul uses a uh, 
personification to express that the teacher of justification by faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. Do not say that Christ must be brought back down from heaven or you will not believe. If one will just consider the evidence surrounding the life of Christ, not only can you believe on Christ without his return from heaven, but you will find it easy to do so. If the facts are there and belief is easy, then one who fails to do so is without excuse. Christ has already been here on earth as a man and has ascended to heaven to sit at the right hand of God. So don't ask the impossible. His return is not needed to believe on him. Now, uh, make a little side note. Uh, you know, remember that the chief priests and elders derided Christ when he was on the cross. Uh, they said in so many words, let him come down from the cross and we will believe on him. Of course, if they refused to believe that he was the Christ on the evidence that they already had, they would not have believed on him if he had come down from the cross. It was impossible for him to come down from the cross. That was the very thing he had to see to the end for the salvation of man. In this verse, a very similar sentiment, sentiment is being expressed. Come down from heaven and we'll, we will believe on you. And uh, that was not going to happen. <clears throat> As I said, verse 7 is a continuation of 6. Uh, who would ascend to the abyss? That is, bring Christ up from the dead. You can't bring him down from heaven. You're not going to bring him up from the abyss. And so this was not. Uh, this is also not going to happen. <clears throat> a man already had enough evidence and facts to believe on the Christ. Uh, justification by faith requires nothing uh, that's either impossible or improbable. It is both practical and easy. And its demands lie within the reach of each one of us. Whoever is asking the question posed in verses uh, 6 and 7 knew that it was impossible for mere humans to go up to heaven or down into the abyss to bring anyone down or up. Therefore, it is a virtual declaration of perpetual unbelief. And of course, belief requires no such impossibilities. What it does require, all uh, can do uh, by the proper effort of the will. So we're all able to do that. The language of verses 6 and 7 bear a close resemblance to the verses from Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verses 11 through 14, which uh, are as follows. For this commandment, which I command you today, is not too mysterious for you, nor is it far off. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will ascend in, into heaven for us and bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. Nor is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will go over the sea for us to bring it to us, that we may hear it and do it. But the word is very near you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it. What Moses said about the commandment is, with slight modifications, what Paul had to say about justification by belief. Verse 8, but well, what does it say, uh, Paul asked. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Now that is the word of faith which we preach. You might uh, check 1 Corinthians, the 15th uh, chapter, verses 1 and 2. And we'll get to that following verse 10 uh, in Romans, a couple of verses later. What does justification by faith say? It does not say, who shall go up into heaven to bring Christ down, nor does it say, who shall go into the abyss to bring Christ up. So what does it say? The word that is near you, uh, which is the thing, thing uh, which is the thing said, uh, is readily at hand, easily accessible. 
Hard things to be done are said to be far off. Easy things to be done are said to be near you. It is easy for you to do. Christ has paid the price. The word of faith, which we preach, is exegetic. Uh, the phrase, what does it say? The word of faith is the doctrine of Christ. Uh, the doctrine of Christ is that which we, which we preach. In this doctrine of Christ, faith or belief is the chief component element. In verse 9, uh, that if you confess, uh, confesses in the aorist tense of Greek, which is what's happened. You know, you, you confessed, it's happened. If you confess, of course, the if is conditional. If you confess with your mouth the Lord uh, Jesus Christ, that is, the Son of God, and believe, again, that's the aorist tense, believe in your heart that God is raised, that's also the aorist tense, that raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And that's future tense. <clears throat> this verse states the doctrine of Christ in a practicable form. Uh, one easily obeyed. Is confession, uh, confession essential to salvation? Is belief essential to salvation? Was Christ being raised from the dead essential to salvation? To dispense with anyone is to dispense with the others. Confess, believe, and, and raised are in the Greek aorist tense, meaning they are one-time events. Uh, the if is Greek conditional, as it is in English. Therefore, salvation is conditional on confession, belief in Christ's resurrection from the dead. Confession and belief, and belief are both easily attainable by any apperceptive uh, person. To be justified by confession and belief is to be saved. To be saved is to be forgiven. The forgiveness of sins and salvation are equivalents. Confession and belief are set forth as conditions to salvation. But are these the total number of conditions upon which salvation is dependent? Now, these may be numbered in the sequence that logically occurs. Now, there seems to be, number one, there seems to be no one who denies that belief in the Christ as the Son of God is, is essential. Uh, as to salvation, and must precede all other conditions. Number two, equally certain is that repentance is a condition to salvation, even among the faith-only adherents. So they believe there's something in addition to the faith only that must be done. The impenitent person is never justified. In Acts 17, verse 30, we read, Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Although in this first confession is listed first, that is, uh, this is not the natural order. Belief, belief first and natural and correct, since no man confesses and then believes, since it is logically impossible to confess something to be true in which uh, one does not believe to be real. Likewise, one will not confess the reality of Christ being the Son of God without first repenting of any offenses to the Christ. The devils believed and confessed that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but they never repented. Repentance is an act of obedience to Christ, which the devils never rendered, and lacks credulity without first belief on Christ. It is that act in its proper sequence on which confession is dependent to have any validity at all. Number three, confession before men that Christ is the Son of God is listed as a condition to salvation. Confession is no more than a mere acknowledgement, is more than a mere acknowledgement that Christ is the Son of God. Since the devils would acknowledge that, it is the acknowledgement that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and it is to him as the Son of God and Savior of the penitent that I owe my allegiance. The devils never did that. And immersion in the waters of baptism is a condition of salvation. 
And we know from Acts 2.38 that in repentance, let everyone you be baptized. In Mark 16.16, 16, he who believes and is baptized. And in 1 Peter 3.21, there's an antitype which now saved us, uh, baptism. You know, taking together, you know, the baptism is essential. And you take all these together, we have four conditions. And the only four antecedents to salvation are justification. Now, no one can rightly point to additional conditions, nor can they scripturally name less. He that has complied with these conditions is pardoned, is saved in the kingdom, justified. The Christian's journey does not end there. He must continually, continually grow in the grace of Christ, who having endured faithfully to the end, is awarded the crown of, of immortality. And since we're a little over time, we'll stop there and we'll begin with verse 10 next week.